beginning. It is January 8th, 2020. We are looking for 2020 vision from our God. And we are coming together to study the beginning. In the beginning, a very good place to start, is it not? Yes. When we sing, we begin with do re mi. <laughs> when we begin with the word of God, we begin with Bereshit. In the beginning. Bereshit may be a new word to you, and as our Hebrew always does, it can be spelled a number of ways. One common way you see nowadays is Bereshit, and I think what they did is try to make it phonetic. Because I'll give you one second, because really closer to the Hebrew would be bear, uh, let's see, the I or the E? B R E S H I T H. That's actually closer to the Hebrew, but it's a lot harder to pronounce. So I'm just putting it up there in case if you see something that's giving you a source, you don't say, what's that word? That's the same thing. Are we having a difference? We do have cross-references. Where did I put them? And they're huge. There's three pages each already. Please tell me they're not sitting at the end. Those are just papers of hers that got wet. Okay, my apologies. I have three pages of cross-references for you. And they're up. I saw two and I haven't done two days ago, so I would not. <laughs> and I guess because I picked up that stack, I thought I had everything. I am so sorry. But you now know anything you get good, all those classes are coming from me, is it? Because you teachers are just as human as everybody else. Uh, I will try to repeat, maybe I'll even put scripture references on the board today. Uh, any of you who come to Shabbat, I'll bring them to Shabbat so you can have them a week ahead. Shabbat is Saturday service, so if you come to 9.30 here downstairs in the chapel, so if you come to that, you can get them. If I'm going to see you somewhere else at a prayer meeting or something, remind me and I'll bring them to you. But my apologies, I really want to get started off on the right note. So um, We are in introduction. We'll see if we get through the introduction today or not. Our intent, and I will tell you from the start, I am not here to race through Genesis any more than I was here to race through Revelation. If we're racing through, if our goal is to get down, why are we doing it? Mm -hmm. Our goal is to drink from the well. Amen. And you know how long it takes to lower the bucket? Yeah. Get that refreshing water and bring it up. And, oh, and it comes up. Barbara, did you get to drink out of Jacob's well in Israel? Um, you may not have. We didn't. We didn't. We did it way in the past. But it's an area now that not everybody gets a chance to do that. But I'll never forget that water. From my great, 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 somewhere in there, granddaddy. <laughs> but I liken it to God's well. Never runs dry. And it's so refreshing. So if you are in a hurry and a surface class, here's your door. <laughs> if you want to use your brain and you want to take some time and dig, come on in. The water's great. We're going to have some fun. So our name that I've given you comes from the Hebrew. And I've already told you that it means in the beginning, or that's how we translate it into English. Really, it more accurately, it could be the origin, the source. It can also be generation in the sense meaning generating. It is a beginning that is generating something. All of this are the root meanings for the word that we get, Bereshit. If you are in the Jewish world of, um, of studying the scriptures, for us it's the Messianic Jewish world, we know that they take the parsha each week, that's, that word means portion, and they study that portion. Often, they give a name to the parsha every week. And by the way, in 52 weeks, we go from Genesis to Deuteronomy. We go from Bereshit to Dabarim. Then we start all over again. So we go through those five books continually. Those are the books called the Torah, the Law of God. The Psalms, the Halim tell us, meditate on his law day and night. That's why we do it. But each week, we have a parsha, a portion that we read, and it's given a name. And usually, the name it is given is the first couple of words of the portion we're reading. Well, really, in essence, that's what Bereshit is. And when we read the portion where we start again in the beginning, it is called Bereshit. 
because the first few words are in the beginning. So that's how it gets its name. If we go into the Greek, is Janessa Os. I might not be pronouncing, pronouncing that accurately, excuse me. I'll spell it in the English for you. G E M E S E O S. This is the Greek where this was the Hebrew. Okay. That's not an A, that's an R. Okay. And it also means the same thing. It is a birth, a genealogy, a history of origin. I need to make sure I get out of the way for the people over here too. Okay, so why are we calling Bereshit origin, beginning, history? What are we going to find the beginning of? Well, are you ready for this? <laughs> Hang on, because in the beginning starts it all. We're going to learn the beginning of the universe. We're going to learn the beginning of order and complexity. By that I mean we're going to learn about the programmer and his program. We're going to learn about the beginning of the solar system. Hmm. Hello, scientists. We're going to learn about the atmosphere and the hydrosphere. We're going to learn that what we call atmosphere and hydrosphere is never found on other planets to this date that's necessary for life, and I mean human life. We're going to study about the beginning of human life, the beginning of man. We're going to study the beginning of marriage. Unfortunately, the beginning of evil. We'll study the beginning of language, the beginning of government, the beginning of culture, the beginning of nations, the beginning of, quote, religion, and the beginning of the chosen people. By that I mean God's channel of his word, God's way of bringing his savior into our world is through this called the chosen people. We're going to get all of this and even more in the beginning. Very good place to start. <laughs> What's the purpose? Well, the purpose is to reveal to man the foundational truths upon which God's plan and his purpose for man can be built. See, man can try to build on his own, and I'll take us and teach us. Man's building on his own when we get to chapter 10, Tower of Babel. Where did that end up? Or we can learn to build according to the foundational plans of our God. And let's see if we're building into the heavens, building into a future. In our beginning, it reveals the beginning of the creation of the world, of man, of animal life as we know it today, of man's fall of salvation as planned by God before the beginning, and of the self-revelation of God to man. Do you realize if God didn't put into man that ability, we would not understand or know that there is a God, but he's put that into each and every mind. We'll see that even in the minds that have not accepted him. We will see the seed that is there. We're going to see four out of eight covenants of God with man, covenanting, covenanting with man. Four out of eight of them are given in Genesis, in the book of Genesis. If you want the names right now, we'll take them as they unfold, so you don't have to frantically write, but if you want, is the Edenic, E-D-E-N-I-C, means the covenant during the time when they're living in the Garden of Eden. We'll see the Adamic covenant, the covenant God made with Adam, or Adam, as we say in Hebrew. The Noah. That's the covenant God made through Noah, or Noah, as we say in Hebrew. And then finally, before we're through with the book of Genesis, we'll see the Abrahamic or Abrahamic covenant. All four of these are huge. They have much for us to learn and to glean. We'll see that the roots of Revelation are found in Genesis. We've just had a great time in Revelation, have we not? Yes. But I also mean in the revealing, everything that is revealed. It is the original birthplace of what is called theology, and the theology is the study of God, and I do not mean that in a way that you can take God and put him under the microscope and scope him out, because <laughs> nothing could be further from the truth. If you think you can put a handle on God, stay tuned. <laughs> be 
be prepared for your mind to be blown from the very first verse on. I can't wait until I get to teach you the first three words. That will be a whole class in itself because it takes that long to go into the depth of the Hebrew and bring it all out. And if you don't get all excited, well, the fourth word should get you there. <laughs> We find in this birthplace, though, that we have in germ form, and I don't mean bad germs, I mean like the seed is a germ that germinates in the ground and brings forth life. We see almost all of what we call great doctrines today. Do we believe in doctrine? Yes. Doctrine tells us there is Elohim Hayim, the Most High God. It tells us, those of us who have this faith to believe, that we have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three in one. It's called the Trinity or triunity of our God. That's a doctrine. So that I, I mean this in the right way. And in Genesis, here we go. And again, this is a long list. I'm not expecting you to write it all down or remember it, but as we go through each step, I will be bringing it back up. Well, the doctrines that we will learn in Genesis are the Trinity. Right away in verses 1 and 2, we see the work of the triune God in the creation. Right in the first couple of words, definitely in the first couple of verses. We'll learn the doctrine of creation and the fall of man in chapters 2 and 3. We'll learn that there is an arch enemy, and his name is Satan, or Satan, in chapter 3. We will learn of God's election, and we'll talk about what that means when we get to Abraham, Abraham in chapter 12, Yitzhak, Isaac in chapter 26, and Yaakov, Jacob, in chapter 28. And in the Jewish world, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, our forefathers, that's huge. We want to know what God said to our forefathers and what they passed down all the way to this generation today. In chapter 3, verse 21, we're going to learn about salvation by shed blood. We'll learn about the doctrine of justification by faith in chapter 15 and verse 6. A quick little shortcut to what justification means. It's not quite accurate, but it's close enough, just as if I never sinned. Just a shortcut to help you remember. Chapter, I mean, sorry, doctrine number seven that we'll learn comes to us in chapter five and verse 24. Comes to us through the character of Enoch, and it's the rapture. Did you know that you can see a picture of the rapture in bare sheet? Interesting, isn't it? Okay, we'll talk about what the rapture means when we get there also. We'll have the doctrine of the tribulation represented by the flood in chapter 6 through 8. How does that relate? Hmm, very interesting. See me when we get to chapter 6, and we'll start it then. <laughs> We're going to, going to learn about the millennial kingdom in chapter 12 and verse 3, in chapter 22 and verse 18, in chapter 49 and verse 10. And by now you're going, she sounds like she's teaching Revelation again. <laughs> you're right. <laughs> because from beginning to end, it's one story, is it not? And in fact, we will see in the first three chapters of Genesis, we can see a lot of what ties up in the last three of Revelation. And I love Dr. McGee. I give credit where credit's due. I love his analogy. He says it's like you've entered into Grand Central Station. In Genesis, you, you come into the station, you watch all the trains go out. And in Revelation, you're in Grand Central Station, you watch all the trains come home. Good way to put it. It's a balance for our entire book that we believe. We are going to see the separation of believers from the world, and we're going to see world of judgment represented us through Lot, I call him Lot, in Sodom, Sodom, and that's chapter 19. You're going to see the doctrine of intercessory prayer. Prayer is so huge. You're going to see intercessory prayer all the way back in Bereshit. You're going to see it in chapter 18, verses 22 and 23. You're going to also see it in chapter 20 and verse 17. How about the doctrine of the incarnation and the virgin birth? Don't we have to wait for Yeshua, Isaiah, our prophet, for that? How about... Just chapter 3 and verse 15. Amazing, is it not? And the death and the resurrection of the Son in chapter 22. We will see the priesthood of Mashiach, of the Messiah. He's not after the order of Aharon, of Aaron. Melchizedek in your English, Melchizedek, my God is king in our Hebrew. And you'll see that in chapter 14. 
verses 18 to 24. We see it told us in Tehillim Psalm 110, verse 4 in particular. And we see it in that wonderful book written to the Hebrews. Hebrews is what it's called, chapter 6 and verse 20. That we see its inception in Genesis. We also see the beginning of the Babylonian mystery religion. Remember we talked about that through a lot of Revelation. We see it start with Nimrod in chapters, well chapter 10 it starts, verses 8 through 10, and we really see it in chapter 11. We see the land, I love this, I got it not get on my soapbox, but it's given to Israel. <laughs> <laughs> chapter 12 and verse 7, and chapter 13 and verse 15, God gave that land to Israel, to the Jewish people, and he even names it in scripture. Yes. It goes all the way back. And we will see divine judgment through the flood in chapter 6, <coughs> through Sodom in chapter 19, and through other times as we go along. We've got a lot of doctrine here, don't we? Mm -hmm. But you know what else is exciting in Genesis, and what I can't wait to bring to you, is people. People like you, and people like me. They're live people. Why do I say they're live people? Because what God breathed in and put in life doesn't die. This <coughs> shell dies, but those that we've called by these names, their soul, their spirit is alive today. That's why I can say they're live people. They were alive in their shell, in their body, on the face of this earth, and they, guess what? Got up in the sun and they went to sleep in the dark. And they got dressed just like you and me after the, the beginning. And what I'm trying to say is they had their ups and their downs. They had their problems. They had their good points. They had their bad points. But they're real people. And I love to help you bring them alive. Especially if you happen to be in the category of those who've been raised with these stories since your early years. It can be all too easy. To, oh, yeah, I've heard that story. Well... May God help me. I left it off the page and turned it around and bring it to you alive and fresh. Because if God thought it was so important to record it for us to study it in 2020, I think we want to learn what he has to say to us. Yes. So we're going to say so much during this time. Let me ask you a question, and I'll bet you're all so smart, you're all going to get an A plus for the answer. What is the most Quoted book, biblical book, in the New Testament. What book is quoted from the most? Not, not what verse, what book is quoted from the most in the New Covenant? What book, I've already narrowed it for you, in our Tanakh, in our Old, what book is quoted the most times, I mean, in, in the, the New Covenant, in the New Testament? What are we studying? What are we studying today? <laughs> Genesis. Okay. Okay, we got to work on our course. It is quoted in the New Testament more times than any other book. Okay. Okay, I obviously did not make my question clear, okay? I knew we went off somewhere, and I didn't know where. But let me tell you, when a teacher has a whole class not get it, it's the teacher's fault, okay? So I'm the one that plucked, not you all. I did. Genesis is quoted more times in the new than any other book we read in the old. And I don't like to call it old, but I'm saying it to simplify it, okay? In the original, very good. There are over either direct quotes or alluded to where it's so obvious we know it's referring to Genesis over 200 times in the New Testament books. I think that tells us how important Genesis is. And that's why I brought that little fact out to you. Also, why else is it important? Apart from Genesis, there is no explanation for Israel. And Israel is critical to our God, to our history, to our present, to our future, and to God's ultimate plan, because he has an ultimate plan. This nation would be an enigma 
without the Word of God to teach us. Because what other people have been displaced, taken out of their homeland for almost 2,000 years at a time, and they still remain the people? My example. Anyone know where the Hittites are today? Is your neighbor an Amalekite? Have you met a Gergeshite? <laughs> I know you've met the termites. <laughs> God's hand on the Jewish people enabled them to continue to be a people, to be placed back into their homeland almost 2,000 years after they were taken out. In 70 AD, they were taken out. In 1948, they were placed back in. That is nothing short of a miracle. And we wouldn't understand why if we didn't have Genesis to tell us the importance of Israel in God's eternal plan. We get a lot in this book. See why we're not going to be in any hurry, why it's going to take us time? Let's hit on the historicity of the book, okay? It is not an allegory or a myth. And I'm going to stand here and claim that and teach from that viewpoint. So if you want to disagree with me, you can disagree with me. But stay in class, and I think you'll be proven wrong. Because people want to take this book and want to say, oh, it's just a good allegory. It's just a good book to teach us principles. It is either a fact, and it's history, or it's not. It's either all accurate, or none of it is worth calling accurate. Because if I have to decipher what part is true from what part is fable, well then what gives me the right to say this part's true and this part's fable? We all would have a free hand at that. We would have confusion. We would have chaos. We could never know for a fact and trust God that we know his word, we know his plan, we know, as I put up here, the Bible doesn't tell us how the heavens go. It's not a scientific book to say this is how it works scientifically. And we know our scientists are still trying to learn how it works. We laugh because they think they figure it out, and then they find out they don't know it. They call Pluto a planet, and then they take that away, and they say there's no more planets out there, and then they find a new one. And then they tell us there's black holes that they can't tell you how deep, how wide, and what's beyond. And we know that we're just a pinpoint in the middle of the Earth, in the middle of a universe, in the middle of a Milky Way, that's in the middle of how many billions more? I mean, our minds have to expand beyond what they can expand beyond. But we know this for a fact because the Word of God teaches it to us. And if we cannot t trust every word of the Word of God, we have no plumb line. We have no foundation. And I would say that we are to be the most pitied because there'd be a free-for-all in everything. We would never know how to get to heaven. That's what it says. The Bible doesn't tell us how the heavens go. It tells us how to go to heaven. We would never know the God of creation in a personal way. We would never know his plan for the entire time of humanity. There's so much more we would not know. And my point of this long and hard is there are even those who will call themselves, and I'm going to put the word in quotes because it has to be, they'll say, oh, I'm a Christian, but I don't believe in creation in Genesis in the first few chapters. I believe in, and they may believe in evolution. They, I don't know if there's any other choice between the two, master design or evolution. If I can't trust those first few verses, then I can't trust the rest of the Bible either. It's either exactly what God said or it isn't. And so when God says repeatedly, and we're going to see it repeatedly, and God said, and God said, and God said, we either take that to the bank or let's walk out the door right now. Go on your way. Live life. Have a blast. Get all the fun you can. Get everything you can. Don't worry about being good morally because what's it matter? Just... Go enjoy, grab it all for yourself, and it's all over when you hit the grave. Unfortunately, you'd have a very rude awakening because you'd find yourself one day standing before this God of creation and having the answer to him. Where do we find that? 
her sheath in the beginning. If the first Adam is an allegory, if it's not how he was created and who he is created in the image of our God, then the one that we call the second Adam, who we know to be Yeshua, Jesus, call that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 45 through 50, and I'll read that for you in a moment. If the first one is not truth, then why would you expect the second one to be truth? Oops. Okay, chapter 15 and verse 45. So it is also written. What do those words mean? It's written. It's been written down for us. It's been written down, I believe, by God through the Ruch HaKodesh, through the Holy Spirit, enlightening man to write truth. That man had the hand that wrote it because God chose to work through that man on earth. And we're going to talk about who wrote Genesis. We're going to talk about what the um, what they are, the ones who don't believe, the skeptics, why they disagree. We're going to look at whether they have a right to say what they say or not. See, I'm not going to just take something and say it and believe it because I want to. I want the proof. Okay, And we're going to look long and hard at the proof. It's either written by God, trustworthy from cover to cover, or none of it's trustworthy. If I told you you could go eat in a um, cafeteria, you can choose from all those foods that you want. There's many. They're delightful. Some are, are more enticing than others. You can choose any foods you want. You can eat from them. But I'm going to warn you, some of them are good and some of them are poison. Now, go eat freely. <laughs> well, what are you going to say to me? Hey, which ones are poison? I want to stay away from them. Okay? Well, wait, if you want to pick and choose out of the Bible, that's what you're saying. This is good and this is poison. It's either all good or it's all poison. Because when you get that mix in you, your stomach's going to tell you the difference between what was good and what was poison. And the poison will ruin the good. One rotten apple ruins the whole barrel. Okay? I don't have any room for I pick and choose. It's all or it's nothing. Either I trust my God and everything he says, or I can trust nothing of what he says. <clears throat> so we'll look and we'll see. Do we have proof? Do we have a right to trust him? Are we putting ourselves blindly into this belief? That's what the world tries to tell us. Oh, you just close your eyes and accept it. <laughs> 2020 vision isn't closing your eyes. <laughs> and I'm not afraid to look. I'm not afraid to pull out the magnifying glass and get into every little detail. And I believe that there is enough to convince even the skeptic, as long as they come with an open mind to the scriptures. The scriptures will convince them. Not me. I'm a nobody. Put me up against a scientist and they can talk on a level I can't. That I can tell them who created science. Amen. Who put it into motion. Okay, so here we are now. 1 Corinthians 15, 45. Also it is written, the first man, Adam, Adam, became a living soul. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. However, the spiritual is not the first, but the natural. You're born naturally before you can be born spiritually. I lost my place, sorry. Um, that then the spiritual. The first man is from earth, earthy. Adam means to be born out of the earth. It means earthy. Okay? The second man is from heaven. As is the earthy, so also are all those who are earthy. As is the heavenly, so also are those who are heavenly. Just as we've been born the image of the earthly, earthy, we will also bear the image of the heavenly. What that's talking about is a second birth. We know that from Yohanan, John, when Nathemus came to Yeshua, and he told him, you have to be born again. Okay, Nicodemus, he's no dummy. Born again, Lord? I'm... I'm just going to put my mind six foot tall. Am I going to fit into my mother's womb to be born again? And the Lord tells him, 
what was born of the water, the first birth, has to be born of the spirit, the second birth. The second birth is called the second birth because there's no greater analogy than to realize you become a new being, just like a new birth. You come into a spiritual realm rather than the earthly realm. That's what this is saying. And now you can know and learn and understand spiritual things. Without that birth, you don't get it. That's why we can have brilliant people who say the word of God isn't true. Because they haven't been born spiritually to speak, to know, and to understand. But if you ask them to prove to you that the Bible is false, I guarantee you whatever they bring to you, you will be able to answer it. Because we don't just blindly accept and leap and hope there's water in the pool. We know and we have proof, in fact, on our side. Okay. Historically, if we did not have... Genesis, we wouldn't know all these doctrines, everything we've been talking about. If man did not fall into sin, there'd be no need for a savior. But what do we read about in Genesis? If Genesis is not true, then neither is the testimony of the prophets or even take it to the apostles. If you can't believe what's written in Genesis, don't believe it in Isaiah, don't believe it in Daniel, don't believe it in the apostles. Paul, who wrote over half of our new covenant, is either all or it's nothing, once again. If it's not true, the one that we call Yeshua Jesus, he then is a false witness because he quotes from them as truth. Now, if he is a false witness, that throws out the theory that, oh, well, he's a good rabbi. Rabbi means teacher. Is a good teacher one who teaches false witness, false truths? No. No. So if you're going to believe what he says, then you get the whole Bible. If you're not going to believe what he says, you have to throw it all out. Because he doesn't give any room to be anything less. You have the idea of 100% or zero. That's where this is at. Faith in the gospel of Yeshua HaMashiach, of Jesus our Messiah, for salvation would become empty. It would become a mockery. It would become meaningless if what he said was not true. And he quotes from the books. Genesis on, he'll quote from different books at different times, giving them authority one easy example that I love to bring out is Daniel. Daniel. Remember the historians. Oh, Daniel could not have been written as early as you say, 500s BC, because he got this war too accurately. He got detail after detail after detail that there is no way unless he was speaking from records. Then they find manuscripts that date back earlier than the war, where he's quoted, and they can't answer that. How can this manuscript be dated before the war that you're saying Daniel had to have written after? And then the proof comes when Yeshua Jesus doesn't call Daniel a historian. He calls him a prophet. How could Daniel know? Because God's orchestrated that plan. He's put every detail in the motion. I laugh when man thinks he's making things happen because all he's doing is playing into God's hand. God has a plan from beginning to end. Is God up there right now pacing? I wonder if there's going to be United States. I wonder if Iran's going to take them out. I wonder if we're going to have nuclear war and have it right now. I wonder if Israel's going to survive because Iran's threatened Israel also. You know, America's the big Satan, but Israel's the little Satan. And while we're watching over here, what are they going to do over here? Oh, my. <laughs> you know what my God's doing? He is sitting regal and royal. Yes. And he is probably chuckling at man's thinking, i got to run around, i got to make this happen. <laughs> His plan is being unfolded. Do we understand it all? No. no. If we did then God's on our level. And I don't know about you, but I don't want God with as simple of a brain as mine. <laughs> I want God who is above me and beyond me, 
who knows the beginning from the end, who's orchestrating it, who has a perfect plan that so loved me, so loved you, that he made a plan to bring you to his eternal home. Do we know where we're going? Yes. yes. On this earth, I make a great wandering too. <laughs> Turn me around and I can get lost in a restaurant. I have a dear friend who says she gets lost in a phone booth. <laughs> I love it. Get lost going in a circle. But I know where I'm going. I know when I leave this earth, where my feet are going to land, and I know they're going to land there eternally. Why do I know it? Because God wrote it. God said it. Exactly. And it's either all true or none of it's true. And if it can be so accurate prophetically that what we just looked at, the study we just came through, that the Messiah could tell when he was going to be born, where he was going to be born, where he would grow up, how he would die when it wasn't even a mode of execution, what they would do when he was on that cross, how they would gamble for his rope, how they would do this and do that. If he can do all of that so accurately, 300 times plus, I think I can trust what he's saying about Michelle's future yes. and the future of this world and the future plan. That is all inseminated, those germ seeds that I talked about in Genesis. A very good place to start. So let's look at the authorship of Genesis. We've got Moshe, Moses. He is supposed to be the author and compiler from comments that are made. But our critics objected. That was the word I looked for earlier, the critics. The critics said the art of writing was not known in Moshe's day. There is no way he could have written it down. So, no. Off the table, it's not Moses. Well, guess what happened? <laughs> you give archaeology long enough, and they prove the Bible true every time. Excavations in Egypt, excavations in the area known as Mesopotamia, where civilization began, have proven writing was not only known, it was practiced widely and in many forms long before Moshe was born. Scripture also, we have the external evidence, we have the internal evidence. Because remember, we trust all of Scripture or none of Scripture. Look at Shemot at Exodus chapter 17, the second book. I'll tell you, I fully believe that the author of this book is also Moshe. But in a special way, too, that we're going to look at. Come on. There we go. Shemot, Exodus chapter 17 and verse 14. The Lord, Adonai, the Lord God, okay, Adonai, said to Moshe, write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua, to Joshua, that I will utterly blot out the memory of the Amalek from under heaven. Remember when I asked you a little bit ago, any of you have a neighbor that's an Amalekite? <laughs> I think God kept that part of the verse. I think the Amalekites have been wiped out of the memory of heaven. I think that we can trust the first part. And notice the Lord told Moshe, he didn't say, memorize it, pass it down orally. He said, write it down. Write it down. And now we have the manuscripts to prove it. Go to chapter 24. We like things more than just once, do we not? Exodus, chapter 24, verses 4 through 8. And by the way, next week when I give you those cross-references that I forgot to bring that are keeping my computer table nice and warm, the, all these references will be there for you. Exodus 24, verses 4 through 8. Moshe, Moses, wrote down all the words of the Lord. I could stop right there. But it says, Then he arose early in the morning, built an altar at the foot of the mountain with 12 pillars for the 12 tribes of Israel. He sent young men of the sons of Israel. They offered burnt offerings and sacrificed young bulls as peace offerings to the Lord. Moshe took half of the blood, put it in basins, the other half of the blood he sprinkled on the altar. Then he took, and that's why I read through this, then he took the book of the covenant and read it 
in the hearing of the people. And they said, all the Lord has spoken we will do, and we will be obedient. Oh, that they followed through in those words. Oh, that we followed through in those words. You want blessing? Be obedient. You want to understand discipline? Do it your own way. But notice, Moshe wrote them. He read them. That means it wasn't just oral. There was something written down. Another example that I won't read right now is chapter 34, verses 27 and 28. I'm saying this for the sake of the recordings. And then you can go to 27 and 28, Exodus also, yes. And again, you'll have them written out for you next week. And Numbers, ben Bar in our Hebrew, Numbers, chapter 33, verses 1 and 2. Just to give you another feel out of the book of Exodus, I'll read for you Numbers. Maybe I won't. Okay, my tablet's frozen. It has absolutely frozen. What did I do? Oh, there we go. There we go. Numbers, chapter 33. And we're going to read verses 1 and 2. Whoops. Numbers. Okay, i got to go back. Numbers, chapter 33, verses 1 and 2. I'm working with a new tablet. Pardon me, I'll get used to it as we go on. My other one died. These are the journeys of the sons of Israel, by which they came out from the land of Egypt by their armies under the leadership of Moshe and Aharon. Moshe recorded their starting places according to their journeys by the command of the Lord. And these are their journeys according to their starting places. What do we have? We have a recording of how the children of Israel went into the promised land. We have a recording that we can study to this day. Then we can go to archaeology and we can look and see, do we find footprints where Moshe said they were? And the answer is yes. I guess so, for 40 years. <laughs> yeah, for 40 years. That's a lot of footprints, is it not? <laughs> and the amazing thing is their sandals didn't wear out, so they kept making footprints. <laughs> okay. Now let me take you into the New Covenant. Let me take you to Acts chapter 15 and verse 1. This is a chapter when you study um, how we are in the age that we're in, the rules and regulations that we follow now. We look at this chapter because a lot of times there was argument. Do the Gentiles have to do what the Jewish people did under Judaism? Or is there a different set of rules now? And we have to talk long and hard about that because we love to argue. You give me three Jews, I'll give you four opinions. Now, throw in a few Gentiles with that, and we got a, a feast for uh, any who love debate. Okay? So there was a council that met. This council was given godly wisdom, I believe, to make decisions of what the Gentiles needed to adhere to and what they did not have to do. See, the argument that was on the table was under Jewish law, they had had to make the sacrifices. The Gentiles were only allowed to come so far into the temple area, and they had to be a proselyte to Judaism so that they were showing they had faith in the God of Israel. Now that Yeshua Jesus has come, his blood that was the sinless blood was put on the altar for forgiveness of sin. Now, do they stop to make sacrifices? In this case also, you have things that the Gentiles did just because we all do according to our cultures. Some of these things were offensive to the Jewish people. And so they talked about, what do they have to abstain from? What do they have to do? Do they have to make sacrifices? Do they have to do this? Do they have to do that? Do they have to be circumcised? These were the kind of decisions that were having to be made. Since our point isn't to answer all those questions now, if I raise questions for you, read chapter 15 of Acts on your own, and you'll get your answers. But right now my point is, verse 1 says, Some men came down from Judea and began teaching the brethren. They began teaching the believers. Unless you are circumcised, according to the custom of Moshe, you cannot be saved. Now, if they're writing this, they're believers, they're drawing on the custom of circumcision. Where did they learn about the custom of circumcision? Were they eyewitnesses to it? Did they live at that time? Are they hundreds of years old that they can say, hey, I was alive at this time? No. No, it says that they began teaching, where did I read it? Um, unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses. Okay, Moses. 
Are you alive? Are you there to say what the custom is? Oh, so how do they know what Moses said? Because they wrote it down. So they're studying the writings of Moses. Now, they're believers that are studying this. So obviously, they're looking at this as a guideline for their lives because they're believing what was written is God's word, not just anybody. And we can throw it out because it's ancient. But they're saying, wait a minute, we've got the writings. We know what's been said. We have to decide how that affects our lives. How do we deal with this? Much of what all Paul teaches, that you all shape your lives around today, you know where the roots are? Judaism. Even all the way back, sure, into Genesis, definitely into the Torah, the first five books. You don't even know you're studying Jewish law and following it when you're following some of what Paul taught you to do or not do. People are amazed at that when they find out. Shaul Paul, deep in his Judaistic beginnings, took it into a complete picture. Remember the bud and the flower? Take away that bud, you don't get that flower. But they're basing it on the written word. They're giving authenticity to the word of God. If it's not true in Genesis, then it's not true in Acts. If it's not true in Acts and the other books in our New Covenant, why are we living our lives according to what was said? If Yeshua quoted it from Genesis, then he's saying that's true. He didn't quote it and say, now, he didn't quite get it right. Let me correct it for you. He says it stands written, and he gives authenticity to it. I think I've won my point. If I haven't, look at Yeshua's own testimony. Go with me to Mark chapter 10. This is Jesus' own words. Mark chapter 10. And we're going to look at verses 3 through 5. Mark chapter 10, verses 3 through 5. Yeshua, Jesus is the one speaking, and he answered and said to them, What did Moses command you? Okay, he's a good teacher. Draw from what you know. Let's use our minds. What did Moses teach you? And they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. But Jesus said to them, Because of the hardness of your heart, he wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And if we go on, he tells them that the man's supposed to leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. So what he's telling you right here, he makes it very clear. God didn't want divorce. He gave it to man because of the hardness of man's heart. Because man was going to act the way man acted. But you notice how he didn't argue with what was written. He didn't say Moses got it wrong. He said this is what Moses wrote down. He gave authority to what Moses was saying. Okay? Look at Yochanan, John, chapter 5. And by the way, these are men who wrote these books, who were alive, who were eyewitnesses to what Yeshua Jesus said. John chapter 5, and we're going to look at verses 46 and 47. And again, we have Yeshua Jesus speaking. John heard it. I witnessed to it. John wrote it. Okay, by his own hand. I heard, I saw, I wrote. Okay, what did he read? What did he read? What did he write? Excuse me. What did he write? Right, oh boy. What did he write? Okay, verse 46. For if you believed Moshe, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. Now, who's speaking? Is John saying that about himself? No. 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 Get it in context, and you'll see the one who is speaking from a few verses earlier is Yeshua Jesus. John is quoting his words for us. If you've got what's called a red letter edition Bible, it's written in red for you, so it's easy to see. It jumps off the page. These are Yeshua Jesus' words. But Yeshua Jesus is saying, if you believed Moshe, then you believe me, because Moshe told you about me. But if you did not believe, do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? In other words, if you're going to say Genesis 1 through 3, creation, is not true, and the evolutionary process that our scientists want us to take as fact today, 
is true, then you're not going to believe anything else Jesus says because you're not believing these words that he said. Either I believe everything out of his mouth, or i got to bring it down to the level of man, and I can say there's mistakes and there's good intents. Mm, I don't even say I want to say that's a good teacher because he didn't give me any room to say that. He either said you believe everything I say. You believe I came from God. You believe I am God. You believe I'm here to show you the way, the truth, and the life. Or you don't believe it at all. You don't get cafeteria style. You don't get to go choose. And by the way, when you create it, you can make the rules. Okay? How did Moshe write Genesis? What method did he write? How did he write? And I don't mean did he pick up a quill and write on papyrus. I'm not meaning that, but I mean how did it come to him? Did it come to him direct revelation from God? Does he claim that? Or did he receive oral tradition, which was passed down over the centuries from father to son, father, well, father to son, to son, to son, to son. Which way? Do we have any clues in scripture how it was? Or, let me throw out a third way. Did he take actual written records of the past, collect them, bring them together in a final form, always guided by the Spirit of God, the real Kodesh? A, B, or C. Direct revelation, passed down by word of mouth from man to man, down through generations, or was he able to take writings that were brought to him and as he put them together and wove it into a complete story, did the Ruch HaKodesh, did the Ruch HaKodesh keep him on track? Yes, it's a trick question. <laughs> it's a little bit of all of those. I do believe the scripture shows us where God said to Moshe, right, that's your direct revelation. I do believe and I will show you from the Hebrew why I believe. And remember, we already know from archaeology that writing was common before Moshe was alive. So were there things written down? Did Adam write down certain things, and did he pass them down to his son, who passed them down? Were they brought to one who was given authority by God to bring it all together and weave it into what we have? I believe we've got all three. And I'll show you as we come to the Hebrew. There's a certain word in the Hebrew that's very interesting, because I do believe that overall we give credit to Moshe for writing it, but I believe that Adam wrote a part, and I believe that others wrote a part. So I believe write was there. I can't yes. wait. <laughs> I believe writing goes all the way back to the beginning. Yes. Yes. And I will show you from the Hebrew why I believe that. Okay? In fact, let me tell you right now, there's a word called toldot in the Hebrew. That means toldot, T-O-L-D-O-T. Toldot. Don't mix it up with another really neat word that I've taught you before. So, toldot, toldot in the Hebrew. Okay? For those of you who've been with me, this, the word that is a worm is tolot. Okay? Now, I'm not, I I'm, I'm just want to make sure it's clear because the word sounds so close. Okay? That word, what it teaches is a picture of what the Lord did for us his crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection. That is fascinating. Now, when you want some time, I'll teach you the Talat. Maybe I'll even do it near our time when we, when we uh, recognize his resurrection, because it might be more exciting to you then. But what I'm talking about right now is Talot, or Talot. I'm not exactly sure my pronunciation in Hebrew is real accurate, because I am not a, a giant in, uh, in language. But it means generations. Now, remember I told you generations meant an accounting, a beginning. You could use the word account also. In fact, in Genesis 2-4, and I'll read that for you right now, in Bereshit, Genesis 2-4, it, whoops, come on, tablet. It uses um, the word toldot and, and translates it. Okay, I'm going to try this one. It translates it account. Genesis 
chapter 2 and verse 4. Okay? Here is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created. On the day when Adonai God made earth and heaven. This is not the translation I have. That's the complete Jewish. i got to see... Okay, I'm going to have to get in a New American Standard because it's a New American Standard that uses the word account. Let me try one more time on my tablet. Okay, Genesis, it should say account. Yeah. My complete Jewish does not, because again, their translations, that when they're trying to stay very close to the Hebrew, the New American will come as close as they can, and it says this is the account of the heavens. What did my complete Jewish say? Here's the history. Yeah. Account is a little better in my mind right now because it's a little stronger. Here's the account. That means here's the record. Okay? That's basically what the complete Jewish is trying to say. State here's the history, but I think that word account makes it stronger. Regardless, the word translated history in the complete Jewish, the word translated account in the New American, take it to the original language Hebrew, you get the word toldot. Here's the generations, here's the accounts of the heavens and the earth. Now, I'm going to ask you, who is there? The Lord God. God. Was Adam there? No. So, do we have a human eyewitness? No. No. Could we write then and say I'm an eyewitness? Remember Revelation, I, John, saw and he said it again and again and again, I, John, saw it. Okay? We don't have that for the creation of the heavens and the earth. We have to take it that God preserved it perfectly for us, brought it down to us in an accounting. That's what it's meant from the Hebrew. And it was also it says in the that the Lord God made good. Yes. In the day that the Lord God made and heaven. Doesn't leave it for question, does it? It spells it out. It can also be translated, here is the chronology of, meaning in the same way, the order, the order of these events, the historical order of these events. Now when we take that into Genesis, and I will teach you as we go along, when we take it and that word pops up, what we're seeing is believed, and I think it's probably accurate, but here's where you hear me saying, I believe, okay? It looks like it's the closing signature, where Adam's saying, here's my accounting, here's my records, and then we'll see someone else picks it up, and we'll see someone else picks it up, because Moshe is not as old as Adam. Now, he knew, probably from after Seth on, he probably knew, well, we know he knew Enoch, we know we knew, you know, others who came since. But again, he would hear it from them. He wasn't there to live it, to see it, to experience it. But it really sounds from our Hebrew like each one is signing their signature to their part to tell that story as it comes down. Now, Adam would have to say, here's the accounting of, because he wasn't there to see it, that he's the first one that experienced it. Okay? So remember? In the original, you don't have chapters and verses. Right. So you don't have Genesis 1, 1 through chapter 3, verse 15. You don't have anything like that. You have a continuous writing. So we'll look at that again, though, because we'll stop at each point, and we'll see where that comes in from the Hebrew. Okay, so we're going to see it time and again. So 2-4 two, two here tells us the history of the generations of the heavens and the earth. We know that we don't have any human author who saw it because they weren't created yet. But we know that Adam, if he had ability, and it looks like he did, recorded it. Okay? Then if we go from 2-4 and go all the way to 5-1, we're going to have, again, the book, which indicates that it was written down by Sefer. I forgot I had it written here for you. Sefer Toldot Adam. Okay? Sefer, S-E-F-E-R. That word is a written document. Many of you know what a scribe is called. What's a scribe called? Now, the scribe, the person who, the scribe who wrote the Hebrew word? Sofer. What does sofer sound like? Is it very close to the Hebrew word that I just gave you? And, and it's pronounced more with an A sound, safer. 
All right? It's not that it's safer. It's, it's hard to get Hebrew into English because Hebrew doesn't have the vowels, okay? But remember, safer means a book, and the one who's writing that book is the sofer. That's the scrub, okay? That's our Hebrew telling us that there's a book, the accountings of which are atoms. Now, do we have a book called the Book of Adam? No. But if Moses took and compiled that into one story for us, then we begin to see if we do have a book called Genesis, beginnings, origin, accountings, chronology. That's what we're seeing. And we will see this written time and again. The Safer told out the Safer's accountings and then their name. Okay? Adam's just the first one. We have it in chapter 5 as Noah's. Okay? Safer told out Noah. Okay? And in Noah's time, his father Lamech, Lamech lived contemporaneously with our patriarchs, including Adam. Noah knew these. He knew the I'll race of Seth and Enoch. But he's going to write on. Because it's like, it's like they put their pen down when their life stopped. And someone else picked the pen up and continued it on. And then finally we have our author that's given credit for writing it all. Almost like he had ghostwriters that did the first parts. But again, he was responsible for bringing it together in a way that we know the Ruch HaKodesh was controlling what was brought down and completed for us today. When we have the history of Noah, his generations, the sons of Noah, we go all the way to chapter 10, and then this time we have the recording of the flood. We have the, the very flood itself, and we have the immediate events after the flood. We have Noah's prophecy, and we have Noah's death recorded in this part. Then it's picked up, the history and the generations, the Toldot of Shem, that goes until chapter 11 and verse 10. Shem was probably the oldest son of Noah. He probably took the responsibility of keeping the records. And he lived 500 years after the flood. So I think he had time to write it down. <laughs> okay? We see it today. How many times do you see a family that has family history written down and one child out of that family picks it up? and continues writing it and passes it down to the next generation. The difference is when it's done by the power of the Ruch HaKodesh, he was seeing to it, it was an errant where we can make mistakes. But he saw to it that the pure word of God is what would be received because he gives no room for there to ever be an error in scripture. Again, it's all where it's nothing. So we go past Shem and we come to Terah. Terry is a familiar name by those who have studied Genesis before. Anyone remember who he's the father of? Abraham. 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 Good for Brenda. Abraham. That's 1110 to 1127. We see the generations, the history, Sefer Todot, Terah. Okay. Interesting, isn't it? The continuity in scripture. The history, the generations of Yitzhak, that's Isaac. 1127 to 2519. It tells all of Abraham's life, and it tells of Yitzhak's until Abraham dies. And we also know that he, he appends the record to include, an appendix, remember, is a, something that's added in, okay? And it makes it clear, and he gives the generations of Ishmael. Remember, Ishmael was Abraham's other son, not the one that the promise comes through, but the one who the promise comes through took the time to write down his brother's generations. Okay, that's written in 25.12. Let's look real quick at 25.12. Genesis 25. This is a stubborn little Genesis 25.12. Gives you time to find it, right? <laughs> okay. Genesis chapter 25 and verse 12 says, Now these are the records of the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Saraz made, bore to Abraham. Okay, the one who's writing it because it's in his section where he's called Sefer, Togot, Yitzhak. So Isaac's the one writing it down. But he's making it very clear. Here's Ishmael's family tree. Okay? Have you ever done that for a sibling? 
I'm sure there are people who have. That I've written it down and done it for your family. Okay? That's what we see that's happening. And it probably was obtained by Yitzhak when Ishmael came back, met with Yitzhak for a reason recorded in history, a, reading, a reason recorded biblically, I mean. In chapter 25 and verse 9, it tells us they came together to bury Abraham. So, Ishmael has gone and lived his life over here. He's married so-and-so, and he's married so-and-so, and he's had these kids, and these kids have grown up and had these kids, and these kids have these kids for cousins, and, you know, all that family tree history. And he comes back into Yitzhak's life at a time when they come together because dad's passed away. How many times does somebody pass away and family comes from back east or, you know, wherever else, and they all come together at that time? Well, if Ishmael told Yitzhak, Isaac, hey, here's my family. And Isaac said, you know, I think it's important we write this down. So he wrote it down. And God wanted it in the family tree. He wanted it in the historical records that are accurate, so God had it, it put in there by Yitzhak, even though it's not Yitzhak's family. It's his relatives, but not his immediate family. And it's carried down where Moshe finally puts it all together. Okay? I think you're catching on. You're seeing how it goes. Yitzhak appended Ishmael's records to be included. Yaakov, Jacob, included um, two documents from his brother Esau. We read that in chapter 36. We'll see it when we get there. And his brother had joined him, bearing his father, in chapter 35 and verse 29. So it's just like us today. Family gets together at the time of the death of somebody that was earlier in the family. And we compare notes and history and what's gone on in the family and what they're doing and where they're going. And if we're smart, somebody's writing it down. Because there just might be a child, a generation or two later, who wants to know about their family tree. Okay. It's interesting in the 25th then his sons, and they mentioned Isaac. He's the one that right, because Isaac was the one of preeminent importance. And we see that time and again. We'll see that God chooses who he says, not according to a tradition, yeah. Yeah. an order. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Promising. Mm -hmm. That I'll bring that out very shortly here. Yes, I will. Um, just going back to Noah after the flood, mm -hmm. where uh, he actually farmed out the globe to his three sons. Mm -hmm. He must have had the record already of where to go. That's a thought. Because it's he the same earth so has been reinvented. Re and then he says to re you, re go and go to his boundaries, and it will be a curse to you if you take Red 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 Right? Yes. I can see your point. Could be. Could be. So he must have had, because he says, if you, brother, goes to his land and take his land, you will have a curse. So he knew mm -hmm. how to divide the globe. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Up to the flood. Yes. Yeah. He must have it. Yeah. Now, it did take on a bit of a different shape from the flood, because we know that's when it divided. It wasn't divided until then. Um, but, but yes, interesting point. He did. Yeah. He had knowledge that we, we don't have everything. Yeah. We have what God felt was important. But yeah, that's a good point. Okay, Genesis 36, 31 to 39. The critics of, of Moshe again try to say, well, how do you know these kings? How do you have the prophecy of these kings? Well, let's look at Genesis 17, which comes prior to... Whoops, okay, I'm in Genesis. Come on. Okay, Genesis 17, we are going to look at verses 6 and 16. Okay, Genesis 17, 6 says, I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come forth from you. God speaking and saying there's going to be kings. In verse 16 we have, I will bless her, and indeed I will give you a son by her, then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. So, God said in chapter 17, there's going to be kings. So when you get to Genesis 36, is it any stretch for God to be telling Moshe was recorded by Moshe in Genesis 36, start with verse 31, and we're not going to read it all, I'm going to let you read that on your own. But it says, now these are the kings who reigned in the land of Edom before any king reigned over the sons of Israel. 
So, Israel, you didn't establish the thought of having a king. You weren't the first one to have a king. It's already been recorded. Is it accurate? Well, how did Israel come about having a king? Does anyone remember? Well, they had judges. You're all saying they had judges. They saw the other nations that had kings. I want to be like them. I want a king. I don't want a judge. I want a king. Right. They're not rejecting you, the prophet, who's speaking the mouth, the word of God. They're refusing God and God's way. Why didn't they want the judges? Do you like to be judged when you're doing wrong? <laughs> Do you want to be like everybody else? How many of you raised kids? How many times did you hear your kids say, but everybody else is getting to do it? <laughs> and how many moms said, well, if everybody else is going to jump off a bridge, are you going to do <laughs> We teach that individuality. But again, it was nothing for Moshe to write that there's going to be kings because God spoke prophetically and told them kings will come from them. Kings would come even in Ishmael's line. There would be kings. So this is nothing for our critics to get all upset over. So we're going to go past it. We're going to look real quickly at the last Todot uh, that we see. It goes from chapter 37, verse 2. And again, remember, at each one of these, we will revisit them. This one takes us all the way to Shemot, to Exodus, chapter 1, and verse 1. And this tells us it's the history, it's the generations, it's the countings, it's the book of the sons of Yaakov, the sons of Jacob. So the events of Joseph's life, Joseph's life, and what his brethren did to him, what they knew, all of that, this was where that was all written down. And they probably, easily, could have written it down when they were living in the land of Egypt, because remember they go down into Egypt for protection. Joseph brings them under his, um, his uh, blessing, brings them into the land of Goshen where they flourish it easily could have written. No one says, well, the time of the pharaohs there weren't writings. Well, again, writing has been proven to be all the way back. But what we have now is that continuation of the story. Moshe is going to pick it up. We know that Exodus is a continuation of the story. We have the end of Genesis where Yosef is and he's going to die. We have the story of them coming out of uh, Egypt. Remember, Yosef says, don't bury my bones in Egypt. When you return to your land, take my bones. Take my bones. And then do we have a recording of them taking his bones? Yes, we do. Because the story was already being written and being recorded. And we see it. We see it come down. So very likely, absolutely direct revelation from God. Very likely books that had been written, again, with God's hand on them to make them accurate, of the information that God wanted to pass down were brought to Moshe. He, acting by the Baruch HaKodesh, the same way Yochanan did when he wrote, or Sha'ol Paul when he wrote, he compiled by the authority of the Holy Spirit so that we have one continuous story of truth. Now, I will ask you, give me any book outside of the Bible where we can have, we know, no shadow of a doubt, every single word written is true. There is not. There is not. There is not. Why do we say the Bible is then? Because isn't the Bible written by man? Inspired by God. And then God says, the words written, the words recorded are inerrant. What does inerrant mean? No error. No mistakes. Inerrant. Now, if God's going to claim that, if he's going to lie right there, I'm going to be very honest with you. I don't want a God who lies in control of my life and control of me and telling me what to do. I don't want an earthly boss who lies. I think lying is one of the worst things things to deal with. I know it's one of God's pet peeves. He puts it on his most hated list. Not only I think because all this evil started with a lie, the lie of Satan to Eve in the garden. Not only that, but I think because what does a lie do? 
It destroys. How can you ever trust on the same level again? Take it into a marriage. A marriage partner finds that their partner lies. There's a lot of damage done in that statement. Now, does that say that they can't overcome it? No, they can't. But is there ever not a shadow of an element of doubt or wonder in the one who was lied to? Probably not. They probably just learned to overcome that and trust that their mate is not going to lie again, that they learn the lesson and won't. But lying, it, it takes your whole foundation and it shakes it. Okay? Now, if I'm going to claim and stake my life on something, I don't want a foundation with a lie. I don't want a foundation tainted at all. And the only place I find that is in the Word of God. And then I look at the Word of God and I test it. Is it trustworthy? Do I believe it's just because my mommy and daddy taught me and they said it was right, so I know it's right and true and good? Huh. That might have worked when I was three. <laughs> Didn't work when I was 33. We look at it. We come at it with our minds that God gave us. Now, I can come at it from one way. A mathematician can come at it in a way I can't. A scientist can come at it in a way I can't. We can take whatever background we all come from, and we can all come at that word of God. And when all of us unequivocally say, it measures up. The ones who don't, the scientists that come against the word of God, put their thesis to the test. Okay, Put evolution to the test. Does it come up? Inerrant. Evolution? It, it's not true. In it, other words. it comes up with error. It comes up with error. They have to admit we think or we've changed here because it wasn't right. This is the whole difference between the Word of God and anything else that comes at it. The Word of God can't be proven false, but anything else can. So again, where am I going to put my faith? Where am I going to put my feet? What am I going to believe? Bless you. In the Word of God. In the accuracy of the Word of God, we are going to see that it is divinely inspired from the very beginning. The very beginning. Um, I'm going long and hard because there are Christians today who say, well, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. I put my faith in Jesus for salvation, but I believe God used the evolutionary process. Yeah, I hear that time and again. And my question to them is, if God used the evolutionary process, then what's he telling me in Genesis 1 through 3? That doesn't come with evolutionary process. That comes in a different way. So if God used the evolutionary process, then God's lying to me right here. And if God's lying to me right here, again, I'm going to discount everything. So... I'm going to keep my eyes wide open. I'm going to keep my ears open. I'm going to use my brain because my God is great enough. He can stand any test and any challenge I can come at with him. But I'm going to see whatever test falls short. God stated it. Bank on it. Bank on it. That's where we're at with the book of Genesis. Um, let's see. I told you everything. I think I have Yeshua quotes. Jesus quotes or alludes to someone in Genesis, one of our Bible characters in Genesis, one of our real people in Genesis, six different times saying it's from the Word of God. We saw it in Genesis 2.24. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through all these, and I'm just going to read them for the sake of the recordings, but you'll have a list given to you next week. Uh, one of the times he's quoted is Matthew 19, 4 to 6. We'll look at that one. But then we go on past to Matthew 24, 37 to 39. Luke 11, 49 to 51. Luke also in chapter 6, verses 29 to 31. And Luke again in chapter 17, 29 and 32 are all times when Yeshua refers to someone in Genesis. Let me give you the one example. Let's go to Matthew. The first one I said, Matthew, Matthew 19 and verse 20. No, I'm sorry, verse 4. Matthew 19, 4 through 6. And he answered and said, Have you not read that he created them from the beginning? made them male and female. 
said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined his wife, and two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. Where do we hear those words before Matthew? Genesis. There's where it's one of the direct words. And sometimes it's referring to the specific person. Sometimes we know who it's referring to because of what's being said. So, Yeshua quotes it, archaeology agrees, and it is quoted more than 60 times in 17 books in the New Testament. Direct quotes. Alluded to almost 200 times. Quoted directly 60 times. Six zero in 17 books. I think we have reason to believe that this is an accurate, trans, uh, accurate recording of origin, the beginning, from the beginning, in the beginning. Let me give you a real quick overview, a background for Genesis. I think I, I think I can give this to you, and if we have to stop somewhere in it, we will. But let me give you the background <laughs> because again, I don't want us to go through this book in the same way you have before. If you've studied it before, if you've read it before, I want it to be new and fresh and alive. I would love for us to be able to put it on a video here and, and watch these people and see it like we see life happening today. We're going to get as close as we can to making that happen. Chapters 1 through 38 are going to give us a view of ancient Mesopotamian life of the culture. We're going to see the geography of the area. We're going to see map making. We already talked about that, how the, the world, the face of the world even changes. We're going to see construction techniques. We're going to see the migration of peoples. We're going to see the sale and purchase of land. Real estate. I think real estate is as old as the Bible. Legal customs. We're going to see procedures of the time. You're going to see shepherding. You're going to see cattle raising. Sound like today? Why would it sound like today? Do you think people were the same back then that they are today? Yes. Yeah, that's my whole point. These were real people that lived and, and breathed and, and had to be educated and went into occupations and lived their life, made transactions, sold land, bought land. They raised cattle some for their purposes of feeding their family. They had legal issues. They had courts. They had judges. They had all this and more. All of this is, is vital for man's life. And the people that we're introduced to are going to come from different ways of life. We'll see different um, occupations. We'll learn how they lived, how their lives touched others' lives, patterns that were formed, ways that were carried down. We're going to meet individuals. We're going to stop and shake the hand of our people in the Bible, and we're not going to not just hurry past them, but let's really get to know Abraham. You know, he was a real person. He was a husband. He was a son. He was a granddaddy. He made some mistakes. Yes, he did. <laughs> and I'm glad they're recorded, because then when I make my mistakes, I don't think, oh, there's no hope for me, because God kept working with Abraham even called him his friend. I love to hear God say, you're my friend. That's a goal of mine. We're going to learn about families. We're going to learn about tribes. Okay, am I talking about the Indian tribes today? No. <laughs> Do you know that more than half of those that are listed in our Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11, more than half are from the book of Genesis? We got a lot of Great people and what they did to study. Life begins in Eden. That's humanity's first home. What did a home life look like? I guarantee you it didn't look like my home today. <laughs> Again in Mesopotamia, the Tower of Babel was built in this area. Abram was born here. Yitzhak's wife came from here. And Yaakov spent 20 years of his life in this area. Now, all three of those patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that was original homeland. But they all three settled in Canaan, the land of Israel today. We find parallels in ancient literature. But notice I say they're parallels. They tell the stories also, but they tell them from a human viewpoint. Okay? We have reference to the god Marduk. 
M-A-R-D-U-K, from the Babylonian era, area. And the Babylonian gods were many, a pantheon of gods. Marduk was one of their supreme beings. We find tablets that tell similar stories to the creation, similar stories to the rebellion of man, and similar stories to the flood. We have clay tablets that date back 2500 and, and to 2300 BC. Those clay tablets are writings. They may not be letters like we're used to. We know we've heard how they've read and knew how uh, hieroglyphics. We know the cuneiform. We know that uh, I know someone who has studied, he's such an intellectual in linguistics that he can read Babylonian. When he finds a Babylonian tablet, he can read it and he can translate it. That's how we know there was writing back then and that it made sense. Okay, these clay tablets were found at Elba. Elba is um, northern Syria. The tell where they were found is called Tel Mardik. It's spelled M-A-R-D-I-K-H. And I think that's because it was taken off on Marduk. They were giving credit to the god Marduk in that area. But those are documents that are not considered inerrant. There can be mistakes found within them. Other documents name our other patriarchs. Do you know who lived contemporary, contemporaneously with Abraham? Who? Job. Job. in our Hebrew? Job. Lived at the same time. Oh, but wait a minute. He's halfway through our, quote, Old Testament. Doesn't that mean he lived a whole lot later? Yeah, but that was the first book written. Job. Yes. And his recordings go all the way back. He lived at the same time as Abraham, or, or very close in time to that. Okay? We find Mari letters, we find Newsy tablets, we find that they relate to life in the early days. We find that it illustrates there was freedom of travel. People got around. They didn't need airplanes and jets like we do today, but they got around. Okay? We find in those writings customs. Those customs talk about the inheritance rights of an adopted household member or slave. Hmm, Abraham, you wondered about giving your inheritance to Eliezer, your servant, when you didn't have a blood son. Were you drawing from custom around you? Could be. We find the obligation of a barren wife to furnish her husband with a servant girl to have children through. Mm -hmm. Sarah, is that where you got the idea? <laughs> Was it a good idea? No. Again, we're not saying these other writings were inerrant. We're not saying that they're good, but they were recording lives back then. Could it be? We know many a times, even to this day, we are influenced by the other gods, where we should not be. They're all little g, not the, the god that we have. Okay? We learn the authority of oral statements on a deathbed. Yaakov, you made statements to each of your sons when you were on your bed about to die. Was this traditionally accepted? All these other writings seem to indicate that. It's called Near Eastern Law. Law. Legal. Judges. Here we go again. Do you see the revelation? It reminds us the people of the Bible were real people. And that's the point I'm trying to get across to you. If I don't get anything else across during the book of Genesis, I hope I make it a real book to you. Real people living real lives that had something of importance to affect us in our lives today. Because it's always told in relation to our God. If the books were being written today, would we be in there? Mm -hmm. I, for one, am glad I'm not. <laughs> I don't want my mistakes hung out for 2,000 years of record. <laughs> That's my pride. How about the age of creation? The age of creation. How old is creation? Yes. We're going to table that question for when we study it because I have to give you a long answer. Okay? But there he is. Uh, two schools of thought on the H. I'll give you that. And we'll look at the two major. I can tell you where I land. But you've got your own mind to make up. What we see... What was written by who and where and what 
What about the Maccabee period? Is that, where is that recorded? Maccabean history books are between the two, what's called original covenant and what's called the new covenant. They're in that time period in between. There's about 400 years of silence between the last written, which wasn't Malchi, the last recording. Well, I'm talking about order, but where, where the uh, original, because I don't want to call it old, where it ended, and then where we pick up with Matthew, there's a period of silence in there. The Maccabean history came in during that time, and the books that are written are during that time. The Apocrypha includes them, and they are dated. It, the, the history happened in 165 BC. They're dated, I think, still early hundreds, I want to say. I don't think they go into AD. I think the recordings are older than that, but they're recorded in, in the in between time. But is there, and is there any prophecy or anything prior that references that? The Maccabeans, not that I'm aware of. Right, but the Maccabeans, it, 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 that was not inspired by God. Well, it was a time. The books were not, the right. historical so records like were not. Right. But yes, it was recorded. It was, it was recorded by the Maccabeans. Right. Yeah, they are the ones given. And Josephus is a recorder of a lot of what was written prior to him because he's in the first 180 writing. Yes, Jewish historian, yes, that, that recorded. You know, again, the same way we see that what God put into what we call the Bible was what we know to be inerrant. The rest we know can be very good history. Mm -hmm. Maccabean history is very good history. It tells us the history. But it, prior to that, that would foretell any prophecy or anything that... That foretold that what would happen then. No, 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 no. It's called the silent years. Four hundred years of silence. Yes, 400 years of silence. Silent. 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 No, God was working in lives, but not in a, a way that he wanted recorded, apparently, for us to study coming down to today. Was that silence? Because in that silence, it makes it all the more amazing when God steps out of that silence in a way that is recorded, maybe. You know, the pause in, in, a, a, um, in, in music, you know, the... the you know, where you have Sila. those, Sila. Sila in the, the Hebrew, yes, where you, you have that, you know, there's that, that sudden pause and the quiet and then boom, you know, was it for that purpose? I don't know. But we don't have anything in errant that we know in the period in between, in that 400 years. The first books that we have recorded are in the very early first century. Uh, they're written, I think the earliest is 57 AD that we, we know was written about 57. But right around in there, um, if Yeshua, and these are all average years, if he lived and died around 33 years of age, we know the calendar didn't change exactly on his, you know, when, when he was born it wasn't zero like it should have been. We know it was very close though. So my point being, within 40 years, within a generation of it actually happening, the eyewitnesses were recording what we have put into the Word of God that tells us it's inerrant. So um, we have what God wanted us to have. The rest we just draw and learn from history. And, uh, and again, it's good history. It happened. Do we know Hanukkah happened? Yes. 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 Because it's recorded in... The historical books, yes. But, exactly, exactly. He, Yohanan, recorded his being in Shlomo's colonnade, which is where they celebrated at the Feast of Dedication, which is the name that Hanukkah means. Hanukkah is Feast of Dedication. So Yeshua is giving his stamp of approval to this is historical fact. This happened. But remember when I taught you, took you through the history, I told you we're told the story about the oil lasting. Mm -hmm. There are those who don't believe that part of the story. There are those who believe that it's the eight days because they fashioned it after Sukkot, the holiday that they had just missed, which was eight days, which had to do with the rededication of the first temple, the rededication of the second temple. So you can see, hey, we're rededicating our temple. This is a second Sukkot. We'll give it a different name, but we're going to celebrate it for eight days. That makes sense to me also. So I, in 2020, have to say, do I believe that we celebrate eight days because of the oil lasted miraculously eight days? Or do I believe it's because of Sukkot and 
the reference to rededication of the temple. Well, I can stand in the middle and say, you know what, maybe both are true. But you see how I have to present to you? I can't say, this is fact. I know that oil lasted. I didn't see it, and I don't have an eyewitness recording brought into a book that I know God has said is inerrant. So I have to say, I think it happened. It makes good sense to me. But so does the other reason make good sense to me. So maybe both. That's where you see the difference. It could be that those writings were actually made, but not discovered. Yes, very easily. And they were definitely passed down. I can tell you one thing that our Hebrew people did was orally passed down. Mm. Even the what they study today called the Mishnah was the oral traditions. It was what they passed down orally, finally wrote them down in about 200 A.D., they began writing them down. The Talmud was written down from the beginning, but the Talmud and the Mishnah are commentaries, people's comments on the scriptures. Orally passed down for generations before they ever wrote those things down. But notice how God didn't worry about what man's opinion was and didn't bring man's opinion into the inherent word of God. You don't get man's opinion in the word of God. You get God's view. And that's where it stands. Man's opinion can be right or can be wrong. God is constant authority. God is truth. God never lies. That's why you have a plumb line that you can bank on. What he says counts. What so-and-so said is good to know. I'm glad you recorded what happened. I'm glad to know about the victory that the Jewish people had over the Syrian army. And yes, I see it the same way that David took down Goliath. I see it miraculous. Yeah. I see God's hand on the Jewish people from biblical times all the way through into modern times. I believe the, the war in 1948 that birthed the nation of Israel, or actually Israel's birth out of the Holocaust, but the next day she's declared a nation, the next day she's in war against five Arab nations that are established. She doesn't have guns, tanks, she's got nothing hardly to speak of, and she's able to fight off five countries and win. That's out of biblical proportions to the miracles of the Bible, but it's not recorded in the Bible. And when I look at my Jewish history books, they all talk about the same story, but they all do have different views. I can bring them all together. Most of it all agrees. But there may be little details. The same way, if we had an incident happen in this classroom, somebody comes in that back door. They run through here. They grab somebody's purse. Ruth, you're in the middle of the room. They grab your purse, and they run out that door, and they're gone. Please show up 15 minutes later. We haven't left the room. Do you know if they interview each one of us alone, we get different stories. Oh, he was six feet tall. He was dark. He was just a little guy, and he was blonde. <laughs> How can we see it so different to live through it? But we do. It's amazing. Look at the gossip line. The kid, the game as a kid, if Tony whispers something to Lena, by the time it comes around, I hope. <laughs> we hope it's even going to be on the same subject. It may or may not be. <laughs> but again, what I've presented to you, no matter how you test it, it proves itself to be true. It never is proven wrong. Ask someone who says the Bible is not true. Where is your proof? Give me your proof. And they cannot give you anything that will stand up in a court of law. They can give you their opinion, but they can't give you fact that stands up in the court of law. Okay? Like I said before, if nothing else, prophecy would prove to me the word of God. If you're going to go out on a limb and you're going to say, this is going to happen and this is going to happen and this is going to happen, you are a prophet as long as it exactly happens. And in scriptural time, if you did that and it didn't come true, what was your fate? Death. 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 That keeps accuracy right on target. That keeps a lot of people from saying, oh, I'm a prophet. Now, forgive me, because some of you may differ from me, but today you have many people who can call themselves prophets. 
Some I believe really are, and some I believe really are not. Okay? Test them. That's what the scripture says to do. If one comes into your midst and says they are a prophet, test the spirit. They should be able to prophetically tell you something that's going to happen in a very short time. And if it does not, do not take them to the next level where there's things going to happen later. Because if they're not accurate here, they're not going to be accurate there. Yeah. Does Satan have some knowledge of the future? Yes. 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 You think we're smarter than him? We know the book of Revelation tells us what's coming. And Satan set up for that? Yes. 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 So they can have some truth. But it has to be something where you know it came from God. If they can't, throw it out. All our prophets, Isaiah, Daniel, all of them, Micah, Jemisha, Ezekiel, all of them, are they ever found in error? Pull me out an error. Give me an error. If you give me one, I'll toss the book. Okay? You can't give me one. It's either been fulfilled and proven accurate, or is yet to be fulfilled. And if all of this was proven accurate, I've got no reason to believe this won't also prove accurate. Okay? That's the word of God. We've laid down a hard foundation because we have to. We're going to build on this foundation. I don't want a house built on sand. I don't know about you, but I'm not going to go down to the beach where the water runs in and goes out and build a house and expect it to be there even a year from now, okay? I think it's sometimes not even a week. I had a science teacher in my college years who said, don't buy certain lands that are on cut and fill, and those homes will slide. They'll slide within the next 15 years. He was a prophet. <laughs> he spoke accurately. I watched news segments time after time after time. Okay? I'm building a foundation here. I'm bringing you a foundation. That's the origin. That is the beginning. If it can be found false, I don't want to build on it, and I don't want to tell you to build on it. But if it can be rock solid, and I use those words because the Lord says, I am the rock of your salvation, then I want you to know this foundation. I want you to go up to this house, and I want you to rattle its door. I want you to try to push it open. I want you to slam it shut and see if it's still standing. I don't want you ever to walk out that door and say, well, I can't be sure. If you can't be sure, then you're not sure. But if God said it, it can be that sure. Notice I didn't say Rochelle says it. I know my limitations. My God is limitless. Okay? Again, my God set down rules that I am to live by. If he's not who he says he is, what right does he have to tell me how I'm to live my life? But if he is right, if he is that accurate, and if he says... Do you want to be blessed? Do you want this to be your future? Do you want to live with me forever? There's one way, and only one way. Well, you know what? I need to listen to him because he's proven himself true. He's proven that he is the God of this creation, and we're going to go into that thoroughly. i got to listen to what he has to say, whether I like it or not. I can kick, I can scream, I can throw my little temper tantrum, but when the day is done and that's over with, his word is still true, no matter how I relate. But if I, as a teacher, am going to bring to you and say, this should guard and guide your life, well, I'm not going to go out on that limb if I'm not awfully sure. If I can't put my life on it, I don't want you to put your life on it. But the very fact that I can and that I do and that many people before me have done the same thing, I have to bring it to you in this way. I have to lay it down long and hard and beat it to death if that's how you feel today. But you know what? I don't know what's inside of each one of your minds. I can't tell you whether everybody in this room agrees with me or not. And you know what? When the day is over, it really doesn't matter whether you agree with me or not. But I can tell you, 
every single one of you needs to wait in your mind what I believe is lining up with the God who created me, with the God who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. If I line up with that, what's the result? The Lord says, I'm making a place for you in heaven. Amen. If I don't line up with that, there is no place made for me the in heaven. Now, God breathed in and I became a living soul. It continues on through every human that's born. What God breathed in cannot die, because God cannot die. The human form died and resurrected back to life to conquer the wage of sin that is death. That's the only part that died. God was alive. God wasn't dead. Yeshua said the thief on the cross, you'll be with me in paradise. He didn't say you'll sleep in the grave with me. He didn't say we're dead. He said, you will be with me in paradise. Yeah. In paradise was Abraham and all the others who believed. This is what God has laid down. And he's given us no wiggle room. So again, before I close this day, and I know I've run over, give me two minutes. Because this is a matter of life and death. Amen. And it's a matter for each and every one of you. Because you may believe it up here even. And you've never taken it to your heart. There's a really good little pamphlet out, and it's called Don't Miss Heaven by 18 Inches. You know what 18 inches is? The difference from the head to the heart. I believe in the facts of history. I believe George Washington was our first president. Do you know there is more historical proof, written evidence, that Jesus walked on this earth, died, and was resurrected? recorded by eyewitnesses, then there is proof of George Washington. Yet, many of you in this room may say, well, I know George Washington was true, but I don't know about this one called Jesus. So let me bring it home and tell you, God gave proof. He gave no room for doubt. He gave no reason for you to question what he was presenting was truth, because he never lied. He's never caught in a lie. He's never caught in a problem. And God cared so much. He not only made you, which anything you make you love, when two come together and give birth to a child, that child was conceived in that love. And that child was loved by those parents. Well, we have the greater parent who made us in his image. And then he said, I want that relationship with you. I want you to know me. I want to be your perfect father. You may not have had a good the earthly father, but you'd have a perfect heavenly father. Yeah. Scripture says a good father, when a child asks for bread, doesn't give him a stone. When he asks for something, he doesn't give him a serpent. I forget what the analogy was there, but you know what I'm a saying. Fish. A fish. He doesn't give him a serpent. <clears throat> this God knows you and loves you Works and all. Doesn't say clean yourself up. Doesn't say get it right. Doesn't say get smart. Doesn't say you got to toe the line. He says all you have to do is believe in me. Amen. I have made the way. That's why I was called the way. I've given it to you in truth. I shed my perfect blood. The punishment for sin and sin is simply missing a perfect mark. That's all it is. It's not just big murder. And not a little oops. No, the little oops is as big as the big murder. Mm -hmm. If you aren't perfect, death is what you bring. The way to avoid that death eternally is in the spiritual. Given to you by the shed blood of Yeshua Jesus, who came into this world, lived this life perfectly, that he might redeem mankind. He didn't become an animal to redeem the animals. He didn't become an angel to redeem the angels. He became a human to redeem the humans. And it's good for every single one. So if you've never opened your heart to receive him, simply say, yes, I want you as my redeemer. I want you as my savior. And God's hearing that right now coming into the heart. Is he coming in literally to the pumping station? No. Even though little Omari, who went for his kindergarten um, t 
testing, you know, to the doctor, or whatever you call that, you go for. And the doctor put the stethoscope to his heart, and he said, can you hear Jesus in there? <laughs> Even though it was that real to him. It will be that real to you in your spirit, because he enters into you spiritually. He takes your heart of stone, and he gets rid of it, and puts in a heart that's soft and flesh and alive, and pumping and, and moving just like the now you being born again. And he gives you the faith to know that what he has spoken is true. And you're his forever. The same way you can't quit being your parent's child, no matter what you do or don't do in this life, you can never quit being God's child once you become his child. Please don't leave this room without knowing that fact in your life. Because you're banking on your eternal status by how you believe. Because we all will have a day when we're not on this earth. And where we go for eternity depends on what we did while we were here. You want to live in heaven forever? In love? And I don't mean I'm in love. That's true, too. I am in love with you, too. But I mean in, in a place of love, of joy, of light, of no death, of peace, of shalom, of no death, no suffering, no pain. No tears. No lies. Amen. Or do you want to live in eternity without all of that? And I don't care how else you describe it, that's hell. Without all that, that's hell. Yes. The choice is yours. I need to close in prayer and give you the opportunity because, again, we're taught to never believe that we know that everybody's on that same page. And we're taught you can come into this life at any moment that you open your heart. So let's go to prayer. And if you have him in your heart, praise him and thank him. And if not, here's your opportunity. Lord God, you are alive and well. You are a creator, you are a sustainer, and you are the one who has provided us eternity either with or without you. That in your love, you gave the choice to us. Lord, I pray for everyone in this room. I have a genuine love for each one who's here. And if I do, Lord, how much more you, their creator. I pray that anyone that needs to right now say yes, says it. I pray for everyone who has you to say hallelujah, to thank you that they have you and they know. Thank you that it's nothing we earn and nothing we can lose. Thank you, Lord, you will walk every moment of our lives with us, that we can always turn to you and you are always there. Thank you for giving us life and then giving it to us spiritually, giving us eternity with you. Lord God, we are blessed, and we thank you. Be with each one this week. Go out with them, and whatever are their trials, Lord, may they see your hand in behalf of their needs. Bring us back together to glean from your word, and again, may it be a life. May we, may we realize this isn't just a history book. This is the living word of our eternal God. Thank you for the privilege of coming together and studying. We bless your holy name forever and ever. The ineffable name of our God. In your precious name. Amen. Okay. I'll try not to run over this badly in the future, but for sure, this is the story that you're thinking about the little girl. You know what this is? A little girl that was asking for grandmother. Jesus is in your heart. Can I listen to you?